Live from Balticon, it's the Myth Wits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring on an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding Geekoverse. We do our damns to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me on this episode is my co-host, Mike Kafis. I'm so hungry! <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I haven't eaten in lunar days. I've, I've, I've got some hot wings for you. Oh, God. <laughs> no hot wings in space. Uh, <laughs> and on my right is Denise Clemens. Hello, thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. And Jack Clemens. Hello, have whatever. Are you, two, <laughs> are you two related? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. We just met and right. we exchanged vows waiting for this to start. Right. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about space food or food in space. Um, so what, what do astronauts eat? What do, what do they eat in space? What can they eat? What can wait, they not eat? Wait, wait, wait. You can't go there to the astronauts. You just have to start with the astro dogs. Astro dogs? Okay. Oh, whoa, whoa. I'm getting way ahead of myself. Wait, I mean, what right. do you think? People were the first people in space? We're not that cruel. We <laughs> send animals up first. <laughs> <Right. laughs> All right, so I think what we're talking about, Laika? Yeah, they okay. ate. They had this little sludgy pudding they had to eat while they were there. Oh, Oh, sorry. I did. I no, you did. did. It's I okay. Did. It's okay. You'll be Pathetic. fine. He'll be what? fine. I thought I just introduced yes, you. Names, yes. Okay, okay, no, not, what, <laughs> not what we bring <laughs> to the table here for guys. All right, all right. Yeah, I guess we should qualify, because um, Mike and I are not qualified to talk about this. But, uh, <laughs> but Jack, Jack why, why would you be qualified to talk about anything to do with space? Yeah, what could you be? Because my wife is here. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so I am a... Um, a writer, but I'm also a rocket scientist. Back in the day, I worked on both the Apollo program and the space shuttle program, uh, and I training the crew and other things like that. And I have a book about it called Safety Curve, the men and women that brought the astronauts. So that's why I'm here, and my role is to, when she's talking about food, is to say, yep, that was Apollo 8. <laughs> <laughs> but and, can I, real quick, you specifically did work on re-entry um, the reentry shapes and yeah, and I'm, the still, I'm still humble to talk about all that. You did it usually, so okay. Yes, yeah, yeah I worked. I, my specialty was high speed aerodynamics, which means I got assigned all the reentry stuff back yeah. in the day. Cool. I'm a food writer, and I've been approached by a um, publishing house to write a book about the food in space. Um, Mike and I have been tossing ideas back and forth, and it was his suggestion that we bring the conversation here um, and share it. I'm uh, my association with the science fiction community as. I do workshops on world building with the perspective starting with what are your characters going to eat in this alien environment. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we were originally, the thought was originally, because we like to do a science, we like to do one science episode every time we do a, a Balticon appearance. Uh, and we were going to talk about Apollo's 50th anniversary, but then uh, I forget, it was Jack, was it your suggestion? I believe it was your suggestion that we, we talk about the food in space. I was like, that's so much better, let's do that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, because everybody's doing Apollo 50th, right? Nobody's doing this, so this is awesome. So we get to be, get to talk about something a little different, which mm -hmm. is cool. And Very I should mention, by the way, that the American Library Association has asked all library, all libraries in the country to do programs about the space program because of the 50th anniversary. But we live in Lewis, Delaware, it has a great library, and they are going to do a whole lot uh, of, Summer long set of programs, and one of them is going to be a Mythwits episode. And these guys are coming down. Yeah, we're going to travel down and go do it again. And we're going to do an Ask the Scientist panel. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and do a Mythwits version of it, and then the folks who are in the audience will try to stump us, and then they can also watch it later. Yeah. Oh, yep. The Mythwits are going to Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> Lewis, or don't show up. Right. I made that mistake when I moved in. <laughs> so, and we're doing two shows. One was not going to be Mythwits. It's going to be. I'm just going to host it yep. for the kids because I don't. You know, I'm not real comfortable like putting people's kids on the internet. Um, you know, it's just. You know, it's a respect thing. And then, uh, and but then the one for the adults that we'll, we'll put that online. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be fun. All right, so let's get started. Laika, what, what did Laika eat? She had jelly-like food protein paste that um, is not unlike the food you give your cat who has hairballs, because they wanted the dogs to be really efficient about eliminating while they were in yeah. space. Okay. That food was never served to astronauts. So about how long were, were the dogs in space? It was not that long, but it, they wanted they were actually trained to do tasks, and it was their reward for pushing a lever or that sort of thing while they were there. Uh, they did the same thing with Enos, the chimp, our chimp that we sent up. And he got, if he pushed the right lever, he got a banana pellet. 
Um, and so he was one of the heroes of, of space because what he proved. Were these um, Enos was in 1961, okay. and then the Soviets did theirs in the late 50s and early 60s. Okay. So. Now I, I know Laika didn't come back to Earth alive, but yeah. did did uh, um, Enos, Enos did? Enos okay. did yes. Um, none of the dogs came back. Oh. What happened to them? They became satellite obstacles in the void of space. They, they were, they were re entried. <laughs> She's, yeah. They were not recovered from the re entry. Right. Did they fall back to Earth at some point? Or yeah. are they still up there? Yeah, uh, yeah. most of them re entered and didn't survive. Right. Okay. And cremated on re entry. Yeah, <laughs> that was it, in a special capsule. Right. Okay. So, um, so, so then we move forward to people. So, the first astronauts that went up, what, what, were, they, what were they eating? It was interesting because John Glenn, as you know, was the first one, and their real concern was, does being weightless affect your ability to swallow? Would we actually be able to eat anything? So, of course, NASA, being a governmental agency, reached out um, to the armed forces and said, so what did you guys eat? And they gave us an early, gave the astronauts an early version of MREs. Looks like a tube of toothpaste, actually. And so he ate, what, applesauce? Yeah. And he also had some sort of meat puree, and he... He said it was quite distasteful, um, <laughs> but it, he proved that there was no effect on your ability to swallow. They didn't have to chew, just swallow. Um, and so that was, that was the very, very first. And he didn't need it because he was there for any length of time. It was just to prove the experiment. Yeah. Yep, that was John Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> so on the, to the opposite of the dogs, when the astronauts were having their breakfast in the morning, they ate what they called a low-residue diet, which was primarily protein. It was usually bacon-wrapped filet, eggs. Uh, one of the guys ate a bluefish he'd caught the night before because they didn't want them to have any elimination issues when they were up in space. They didn't want them to eliminate at all. So, so this the this period of um, kind of research was this during the Gemini Mercury. or still, in the, all, still, still, still in the Mercury? Still in Mer okay. Mercury. Mercury was really, 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 really basic. Um, the last Mercury program was in '63. And um, Gordon Cooper went up there, and over the space of only 34 hours, you know, this could be a book, 34 hours, he lost eight pounds. Oh! He didn't like the food, didn't eat the food. He's in this hot environment. It's not sweating like a sweat box, but he was so disinterested in the food that he ended up losing all, those, all that weight in just a day and a half. There is a fad diet. There yeah, it man. is. There it is. Space the diet. diet. <laughs> well, I can see me. I'd still eat the fat moment. You're like, oh, it's so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> nom, nom. <laughs> Space food. Nom, nom, nom. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So, um, so, so there's the first generations of this. They're eating paste. And paste. Stuff. And some little cubes of, like, freeze-dried junk. But they learned that those were a problem because they would sort of disintegrate, and then they'd have to, uh-oh, this better not go in the ventilation system, uh-oh. Oh. So that became a problem. So in Gemini, they started coating these things with the gelatin that would keep them intact. Right. So that, that's and, a, and a powder. They, they would put things, like cover certain things in a powder, correct? Right. And that was when they first started reconstituting stuff with water. And they used a tool that looks like a dentist tooth extraction device, but it would actually be hooked up to water supply and injected into a plastic bag, and then they sort of shake it out, and they take it out, put a straw in, and drink it. Oh, and that was when the Tang so stuff delicious. started. Yeah. So Tang was on the market as an orange-flavored breakfast drink before the space program began, but those clever, clever guys yeah. said, oh, they're drinking reconstituted orange flavored powdered drink crystals. Let's tell everybody they were drinking Tang. And that's when Tang started having all these ads that had pictures of astronauts and spaceships and that sort of thing. Wait, 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 wait. So, so they never oh, actually wait, wait. Wait. Tang? So they didn't really take Tang up? Well, no one will no admit. Child was alive. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> childhood. Childhood. So there was an interesting thing going on in those days, and that NASA forbade the astronauts or anybody associated with it to do anything that was marketing anything, and so they would not. You know, you hear all these ads about they had psycho, uh, psycho watches. 
They couldn't. They would not confirm it. They would not let them advertise about it. The astronauts couldn't say anything. Conversely, they couldn't argue against it. So when Tang said that's what it was, NASA was just silent. But crafty, crafty. But <sighs> later in his life, Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon, is widely quoted as having said. Tang sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and the feeling was mutual. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. And, and so, just real quick, because we're going to be talking about what people eat, we've already talked about having the, the, the particles getting into the, mm. uh, into the air, so like sandwiches are out, right? Well, especially a corned beef sandwich that you purchase at the deli on your way to your flight. Right, that you would slip in your suit. Mm, and... One guy bought it, one guy stuck it in a space suit, and then Gus Grissom yeah. took a bite and watched breadcrumbs, <laughs> and then they put it away, and they forgot when they got off, they left it on the... <laughs> and so when they... Bunch of bad, <laughs> they, bunch of bad boys. They had to go appear before Congress, <laughs> and they started all these rules about stuff you may not take with you on the spacecraft. And that's right. why they couldn't have nice things. That's right. Because <laughs> one guy spoiled it. God, that is every rule in government. <laughs> yeah. Right, so... You only can get to get away with something once. Right, and then no one can get away with anything that's remotely similar to yes. that. Well, and just like Tang, the, guy, the deli at which he bought it um, put a picture of an astronaut on the front of their menu. Right. So if you go online to their website today, they have like these old menus and they have a picture of the astronaut. <laughs> but they, NASA will neither confirm nor deny <laughs> that, that actually happened. Whether happens. that happened. There's right. a really, really good book. I think it came out of MIT Press called Marketing the Moon. Uh, it's a, 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 mostly photographs, but a a lot of text in it, and that's you'll discover a lot of this in there, and all the stuff that went on about NASA absolutely refusing, absolutely refusing to let them do anything that was commercial, and how the businesses then kind of figured out, okay, <laughs> go with that. Yeah. <laughs> They're not going to say no, so good, just go ahead. So we'll say yes. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, let's move on to Skylab because that would wouldn't that be wait, wait, pretty wait. much the can't next? We, no, we, we can't, can't leave Gemini without Gemini. introducing shrimp cocktail. Shrimp cocktail was far and away the most uh, uh, happily eaten food. One of the um, astronauts ate at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was all he ate. And here's why. So they would freeze dry the shrimp, and then they would rehydrate it. But inside of it was this horseradish tomato sauce dip. And so when you're in space your fluids settle differently and your nasal passages become clogged and everything you eat tastes like you have a head cold. So those little flecks of horseradish were like, oh, food, I can taste it. Nice. <laughs> so that was, so that we had to have, have to have shrimp cocktail because that is still popular even today. They might have even eaten the bomb for that reason. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you uh, um, embarrass yourself, you need to have the rocket scientists come in next because... <laughs> Space, the Skylab was after Apollo and before shuttle. It didn't come next after Murphy. Right. Sure. So, so you said, look. So just don't you can't, embarrass him. Just keep. <laughs> so, well, from what I understand, <laughs> the, the, the foods that they designed um, for uh, during Apollo, that all that all that stuff from Gemini and Mercury, that was for Apollo. They pretty much hadn't changed. Correct. Much. Oh, never mind. And <laughs> and um, yep, that was Apollo. And, uh, <laughs> but the, they really tried to, and, and, and part of it is I think people want to show off a little bit, and science, science wants to mix with uh, technology, and the, they, they started saying, oh, well, this is, a, this is this new way we could actually have it be more home-like, right? It was a, an oven, and we have an oven in space, which it's is an scary. Oven, <laughs> a, yeah, a freezer, yeah. and a refrigerator. Um, they had ice cream. They actually had a galley, so they used an old Saturn V rocket as the Skylab, as the habitat, as the habitat, and they had a real galley, and people would actually sit down. Now they had a lot of um, Velcro and magnetic features to keep the cutlery and stuff from flying around, but they actually ate like quote normal people in Skylab, and that was a huge um, marketing feat because it made it look like they're just. Home up in space. It was like a pre-prepared tray mm-hmm. that matched this way this oven, so they would lock it into this oven. Certain areas would be heated because other things didn't need to be heated, and you knew that everyone, everything was designed ahead of time, and, and then it was heated. But there was a, from what I understand, the biggest loss 
over this whole thing was the amount of power it used, it's, the amount yeah. of weight that it caused to send everything up, and it's it, such it, a waste. It, the, the refrigerant, yeah. um, the power they couldn't mm. even they couldn't sustain it. Right. Did the food that food program fail before Skylab failed? That's what I, I do not remember. I think they went out together. I think they let it stay, used it less. Okay. And gradually, because they, they knew that it was going to end. So they just, mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't use it as a way to um, do the kinds of experiments that they would subsequently do on shuttle. The, the original, uh, so Skylab, actually, if you don't know much about it, you really ought to go online and take a look at some of the videos. Because it, it really was the next, uh, the next program right after Apollo. And, it, and remember, while well, a bunch of Apollo uh, flights were canceled, and so they used the same equipment. Even They even got to it, the command modules. And you look at these videos, and it looks like the International Space Station. So you're looking at Nepal, and those guys are all crouched in there, and they're going to the moon. Here we are like a year later, and they're doing somersaults. I mean, it's this is magnificent space station, and it was built in anticipation of using it. And then shuttle was supposed to go up to it and use it as it said. And then shuttle got delayed, and they finally had to give up. Uh, it delayed so long, so the thing kind of crashed into the ocean. But it still had three teams... Three separate teams of astronauts go up there, and each stayed more than a month. It was one for 74 days, and they did a lot of really neat experiments. And then came back on an Apollo's command module on Monday. It was kind of cool. Right, and without it, we'd never have yes. ISS. No, no it, was, it was where we learned a lot about ISS. Jeff. And if I can interrupt a second, sure. there was not a, because we haven't talked about this, so there was not a significant difference in the Apollo, what they, how they ate on Apollo, or like at the lunar module. They, they had more food that looked like food, but it was still, um, basically they had to do freeze dry and um, they had like three categories of food. They were either irradiated and, or they were freeze dried or they were allowed to maintain their normal um, condition and could just be eaten like um, some of those would have been fruit, like, uh, like dried apricots or that sort of thing, which were low moisture content and they didn't need to be rehydrated, but they would be okay in these plastic bags and stuff. Um, the key thing that all the, the researchers worried about was nutrition and food safety because this is, you have to make sure there's not one bacteria inside that plastic package or tin can or whatever it is you're using um, because that's all it takes is that, that dead astronauts and, and no way to get them back. During that time, did, when you're saying freeze dry, <laughs> Did they literally freeze dry and have to eat it freeze dried, or did they always rehydrate? They rehydrated. They so okay. the first few they used cold. Well, Gemini they used cold water. Apollo introduced hot water, and then um, on Skylab they had all kinds of ways mm -hmm. to heat and cool. So the ice cream, the astronaut ice cream, is that a thing? Did, did astronauts really eat that? Because I've, I've, I've already been I've, I've, I've already been ruined for the tang. So the what you buy at the Smithsonian is not what they have. Okay. Damn it! <laughs> Sorry, Damn it! It's all right. I know. I know. It's you it can imagine the ice cream. Science is a cruel mistress. <laughs> <laughs> no, An marketing ice cream cone in space <laughs> with zero g. That would be an exciting day. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so much for that. Yeah. <laughs> so can we? Um, is this a good time for me to uh, or us to just have a discussion about? What types of foods, even till this day, are either uh, especially not permitted or even banned from space? Can I can I hit you up with a list if I yes. were to say this is a, some? So I did some research and uh, I was told about some of these now. I, I found out about some of these things. Um, carbonated soft drinks. Oh yeah. Uh, imagine burping in space. Oh. <laughs> they have, they were they were banned they were banned from the get go. They were just they they just they couldn't do it. They couldn't control the effervescence. Or the pressure. The pressure. Right. right. And and then if you did drink it, the pressure, I mean it would be there's actually an online article all about the mechanics of burping in low gravity. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Everything You there. heard it here first. <laughs> and it, they did nothing but just like basically regurgitate or vomit it up again. That was the Right. End. And it wasn't yeah. a dry vomit. No, not, <laughs> not a dry vomit. Uh, frozen food. Uh, uh, since Skylab, there has been no frozen food in space because you can't keep it, ironically, you can't keep it at the right temperature it needs to be, even though you have a whole you know, vacuum of space outside. It, too, it gets too cold, 
And there, why bring and expend so much power to keep it frozen? Exactly. And not only that, but for anything going to the space station and the pallets of food that we'd be, be loaded onto the space mm -hmm. shuttle, they were prepared weeks and sometimes months in mm -hmm. advance. So you could control them at a um, normal, like roomish temperature, or maybe a little cool, but there's no way to have kept ice cream or any other frozen food from melting. Space technology, the space food technology has done a lot for the food preserving technology yeah. in, um, in general yes. on, on Earth. Yes. So uh, that's a. So whenever people talk about NASA's a waste of money, <laughs> right? Here's yet another place right. where that has transitioned yep. to all of us. Exactly. And, and one of the beneficiaries are our soldiers, sailors, and everybody who's out serving their country um, because those MREs got a lot tastier as the sophistication of mm -hmm. the NASA technology evolved. Yeah. Powdered seasonings, obviously. Uh, herbs, we talked about. And as you said, we the only <laughs> way... Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 all I envision... Blounded by the salt. <laughs> I, I envision the stuff? Homer Simpson floating around in that episode where the ants are like crawling around the crumbs. And <laughs> that's just, that's all you need to know. Um, but we have been able to have herbs and um, Season. seasonings in space. It's, it's um, infused in pastes. And uh, it's also um, like just sriracha is really popular yeah. on station. Yeah. Salt and pepper in a, in a just a li in a liquidy. It's the, liquidy well, form. yeah, the salt's yeah. dissolved in water, and the pepper is suspended in oil. Seawater, done. <laughs> salt, <laughs> you got it. So, all right, um, red wine. If I, without even <laughs> me bringing it up, what, so, do you, what do you know about red wine in space? So what happened was they wanted. They were actually testing um, your ability to taste sweetness because they discovered that they had this strawberry jam and a strawberry compote. Now, strawberries are a weird fruit. Their juice is super, super sweet, but the flesh can be a little bit tartish sometimes. So they tried to feed them reconstituted, rehydrated strawberries, and every single person who tried them said they were awful. They were just too sweet. So that sensation, which is on the front of your tongue, was highly acute, and so it was too sweet to enjoy. So they did an experiment to serve, and it was like a Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill kind of wine, and universally rejected. Like, it was unpalatable. <laughs> so, and then they said, wait a minute, wine and space and, and this electronic stuff, we're trying to do careful, very meticulous things. <laughs> <laughs> it was bad. Yeah. It was, I read about a, uh, a particular instance where they were trying to find the right wine right. to bring into space. And they, they had settled on some, you know, California vineyard of a, some of, obviously, it, obviously it wasn't a creamy wine, but they had some creamy or some sort of a name in it like that. There was, however, they got to the vomit comet. And the, the people, went, even just opening the pouch to drink it, the, the, the way, like we were talking about, the way you smell it just reminded them of vomit, and they could not even bring themselves to drink it. It, it was it was its own built-in failsafe for yeah. drinking in space. <laughs> That's right. Until the Russians will yes. get to that. Did you? Did, did everybody know what the vomit comet is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and yeah, so it never even made it into space. It was it was like it would stop no, there. Not happening. So, um, how about fish in space? That's another aroma problem. Yeah. As long as you don't microwave. Yeah. 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 No, no. They could they couldn't they couldn't make the the because the odors in in station or in shuttle persisted. I mean yeah. you, you oh, just, imagine, imagine You know that day in the office yeah. <laughs> that co work it never oh. goes away. Oh. And that's why shrimp cocktail worked. Yeah. Because shrimp is essentially odorless. And so once it's rehydrated, and plus that it's drowned by that tomato or horseradish mm -hmm. thing, but that was the only fish that's been allowed to yeah. return. Actually, it's not a fish, it's a yeah. crustacean. Sea, right, seafood. Yeah. Had you heard, this is almost like a test. She is like, I, I thought I'd have something. No, you got <laughs> nothing. We're not done yet. You got nothing. We're not done yet. How, not done yet. <laughs> how about reindeer jerky? Did you hear about that no, one? No, we had to go with moose because it was around. <laughs> <laughs> it was around Christmas time, and they were—he was Canadian—and they were afraid that the Americans would be sad that Rudolph and all were. We're eating Rudolph. Oh my God! So they, the, the Canadian. 
Canadian Space Agency banned. <laughs> but right. Moose was okay. Moose was okay. <laughs> Musket squill. Right. Moose is squill. Right. Yes. Welcome to my world. And well, we covered astronaut life journey. So yeah, that that is uh, a, a, even a, just a small list of things, and and that are really. Oh, you know what? Uh, well, the fish that I read about, they said that it is technically not banned, but every mission commander has the right of refusal. <laughs> every mission commander not on my watch. <laughs> has refused. <laughs> so every, every astronaut that goes into space, and it started with shuttle, there was a list of 500 different foods, and you could pick out what you wanted for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for however many days of the mission, and that was reviewed by the mission commander. So if you made the mistake of having, you know, tuna noodle casserole, you were just not happening. But the other thing they discovered is that there was a lot of leftover food. They would be busy. They wouldn't be hungry. Um, they noticed that uh, a lot of uh, bone loss in the, and they learned a lot about this from Skylab, that you weren't getting enough calcium, and so they tried supplements, and that didn't work because people were even less likely to take pills. So they were constantly trying to figure out how to add nutrients to the diet that the astronauts ate so they wouldn't be without some of the serious minerals that they needed. A anything in, in that tube was a puree. Right. Like, have you ever taken any meal you've ever made and decided, hey, this would taste better if I blended it. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah. yeah, but so how about how about stuff like like Skittles and stuff? You can eat that, right? I mean, that's fine. Those are so. There was a whole thing about chocolate. Yeah. So we went to watch a launch of a resupply mission to shuttle, you know, to station, and what on it was like some sort of. Voorhees chocolate from Belgium, and the people on station were so excited, and that was the mission that exploded on the launch pad. Ooh. And yeah, we lost the students' experiments, and we lost all the technology, but we didn't get our chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> they were really sad. Yeah, we were there for that. It was an exciting so, flight. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of this stuff doesn't sound like it involves like serious chewing. And Correct. In, in the process of all these years of all these experiments, have they found that, like, for your 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 dental health, right, is chewing necessary? Is it is that something that they have to either emulate or have something to do? They chew a little bit. I mean, they don't. They yeah. don't. I mean, the shrimp, for example, you chew that. Okay. But it's not. And uh, uh, freeze not freeze dried. Um, sun dried avocados or you know dried fruits. You chew it a little bit. Jerky. Um, jerky. Yeah. The, they don't want it to be too loose. That it's mm -hmm. going to get into the atmosphere. Okay. Um, so there's there's a really cute little um, space station episode or YouTube where a guy is eating a tea. He has a cup of tea and he splashes and then he catches the droplets with his chopsticks. Right. So, um, <laughs> so I know that's not chewing, but the chewing was, was primarily um, to make sure that the food wasn't sloppy. And that's why they used straws and then originally used plastic bags and then gradually got to food that was relatively well contained. But they didn't see chewing. Mm -hmm. this, this no. yeah. they, I mean, they wanted all your money. That's so why they go on the, um, the bicycle and the mm -hmm. treadmill and stuff to try to keep those muscles yeah. um, in, in good shape. What about gum? Can I have gum? That's a good one. I've never run into that one. Mm. Huh. We'll make a footnote on that one. But I'm definitely going to say no, bu no, no, no bubbles, right? Pop <laughs> bubble, a bubble. Little bits of gum floating. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, or it pops. Right. Yeah. <laughs> get off! Get off! You breathe! <laughs> All right. So I'm what's, ready, Mike. What's next, Mike? What do you got next? Uh, let's see. Um... We talked about the hydrating, the dehydrating, the rehydrating. Um, the, the latest technology with that, I feel like, has almost gotten astronauts to uh, a, a very uh, satisfied state. Um, the, uh, the, the Japanese uh, are very proud of the, the types of foods they're able to make and and just they know exactly, you know, and, and there's there's a little dial, like the, the system is, is universal. We'll be talking about, oh, well, the Japanese do this. Everybody uses a universal system for this dehydration, and they, they know the amounts for rehydration, and there's 50 ml, and 75 ml, 100 ml. There's a little crank you turn it, and it's hot and cold water on the station. Um, I guess there is power 
needed for Some, you know, having a, the water. A, a lot of things have power sure, extension. Sure. Yeah. So, so um, and, it's very precise. Yeah. yeah. And and the, the temperature is precise and the amount that it dispenses is precise. Not like our refrigerators, by the way. Because <laughs> you know <laughs> anyway. Um, so but you know they, they're very proud of the 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 types of foods they're able to have and the curries and the, just the different flavors of foods. And yeah, and all the nationalities have done a really good job of making sure. One of the things that the psychological research that has been done about astronauts is, I mean, think about food. And we eat at least three meals a day. Some of us eat five or six. Um, mm -hmm. It's a, a point in time to be with your family and your friends. There's a lot of ritual associated with eating. And making... And one of the things they noticed in Skylab was that this communal meal was really restorative to the psychological sense of loneliness and distance um, from their earthbound families and friends. So food and sharing food in a communal basis has become a ritual that's important, um, especially on station. Yeah. Yeah, there's not much of an in-group or out-group if you start... Yeah, no. <laughs> Let, let's talk a little bit on the, on the culture side of that then. So, uh, Thanksgiving, do they have turkey and cranberry and all that? Yes, unless there's something that goes wrong and then the Russians share their borscht. Borscht, okay, so oh, the Russians have right. borscht, all right, cool. And originally, the, on one of the Apollo Soyuz missions, um, they wanted to have, you know, share their foods. So there's a picture of two American astronauts with tubes labeled vodka. In Russian <laughs> Cyrillic, it's actually borscht, but they were Russians were saying, "Yeah, have some of our vodka." <laughs> but they did have vodka. I don't know, no. and no one will admit it. But right, oh, okay. No one will admit oh. it. That's right. Because we saw in Gravity, he pulls out that. He had the whole kit. bottle. Yeah, of I know. Of course he did. There's the glass <laughs> bottle, right? Of course he yeah. had. It was <laughs> also a, a great <laughs> example of orbital mechanics, right. <laughs> as we talked about. Right. It. <laughs> <laughs> Space. Let me suggest that if you ever in the spacecraft and you need to go from one orbit to the other, you do not use a fire extinguisher. Yeah. That is, that, that is guaranteed to have a bad ending. <laughs> <laughs> no. So what do you do for like hot liquids, like your morning coffee? You don't really drink that through a straw, do you? When no. You're in space. When yeah. they have sippy cups. They have okay. sippy, cu sippy cups that have, um, you, you, probably, you probably, you might even have one at home, that you control the opening of. Yeah. So it's not, so it's not like you have to suck it through a straw, but it's more okay. like a, a, a contoured little sippy cup. Okay. That you, so you can take little small sips of the hot coffee. But it does come from instant coffee. Until, yes. until, do you want me to wait? Oh, okay. Friend, huh? okay. So um, the uh, Christopher Reddy, an Italian astronaut, was on shuttle at the station and Nespresso got together with their researchers mm -hmm. and talked to the engineers on station, and they worked out the gravitational um, dynamics to figure out how to actually force hot water through a basket of coffee grounds to make espresso. Superheroes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, if you think, I mean, about, it, think yeah. about it, if you think about it, and you see this also when they're trying to grow things on on station. So it was all the big deal. Oh, we're going to grow our own vegetables. Well, let me see. So I've got a pot with soil in it. Well, I've got to put something over that to keep the soil from getting jostled or anything. <coughs> How am I going to water this? Because that water's not going to go there. It's going to go there. So what they had to do um, with the the water, the dynamics that force the water in the right direction, overcoming the gravitational issues, that's a pretty phenomenal piece yeah. of engineering. Yeah. And, it's, and they call it the espresso. As in the I -S 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 <laughs> But it is expre ex espresso. And it was it was put up there by the French. Yeah. It was so cool. Italian. And it's still there. Italian. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Italians did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, that, yeah. That, that was the that Italian. That was <laughs> <laughs> dehydrated that you croak. So um, that's a space term, I'm sure you all heard it. Like um, a frog. Hey, is that a, yeah. <laughs> but, Jack, but, Jack what, what station was that on? What, when did they start using that term? Cro what's that? Croaking? Croaking. Uh, was that Apollo? Yeah, or? that was Apollo. Okay. 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 But so 
<laughs> so, for example, we all know people that can drown their French fries in sriracha sauce, mm -hmm. and you watch them and you think, you're going to eat that, you're going to die if you eat that. And then there's other people that you put one drop in their cup of soup and they barely can finish it because it's so hot. So a lot of that's got to do with tolerance. And the food, as, as I said, the food that is sent up is specifically tailored for each <coughs> individual. Um, so, and they express their preferences for the degree of heat or not, um, and what specific foods they want. So they are careful about but that. Equally dangerous, though, and I think is what you maybe were speaking to is uh, one one little speck of the bomb yeah, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, or yeah. anything. I mean, floating around there, it's it's literally um, what are these things? Yeah, it's called in um, in on oh, the sea. Free floating bar no, no, they're in spa in um, on the sea. You know, mines. It's like a okay, sea. It's like a mine. Like a you know what I mean? You're like it's just hit you right in the eye and that's it you're ah! done <laughs> they, they've done a lot of and if you see some of the pictures of them eating they've done a lot of containment with mm -hmm. the foods to make sure that they don't go so is there is there I'm, I'm assuming that astronauts have to go through eating training right I mean do they they have to train to learn how to eat in space right no no they, well they have to learn how to use the mechanical pieces right that's and they're, yeah. yeah but they don't they don't have to worry about them being able to eat so yeah there's it's training on how to dial up the right number of milliliters for your rehydration process and using the the various tools and techniques and making sure you understand the importance of anchoring that tray so it doesn't float away that sort of thing can, can I yes uh, anchor onto that statement for a second <laughs> um, we know, and uh, I think everyone here can pretty much envision, like, well, what, are the, what would be the best ways to hold, keep things down or hold things down? You know, there's the Velcro, and there's magnets, um, and clamps. So what is the latest, like, popular, most useful thing? Or is it, it really depends on what the need is? It depends on the circumstances and whether they're eating at a communal mm -hmm. setting or whether they're at an, at an instrumentation panel and they have to... Um, you know, basically set it in loops into the wall so it doesn't fly away. So it depends. And it's constantly evolving, too, because the space shuttle, the space station changed shape over the years. Sure, yeah. So they got more and more sophisticated <clears throat> ways um, to hold things down. I highly recommend, if you haven't, uh, on YouTube, there are a couple of very good um, tours of the ISS, the recent ones. And it's just, I mean, like, it's like 40 minutes. And I mean... When you're at work, come on! You, I burned through forty minutes like that, and it was—it was the best forty minutes I ever you know, used. It. You know? Boss does not agree. <laughs> but, but seriously, it very, very, just amazing. The, you know, the, how it was pieced together, and then you know, <laughs> there's a, there is a little bit of like, well, that's over there, and, there is, and it's getting so big now where there is starting to be some in grouping and out grouping. So, it's so like a five-story, like a five-story house. I mean, mm -hmm. five-story uh, apartment. It's got that much living space, and it's got the um, it's baby got window, the, the, the new bay window, window that they can look out. It, it's it's got two or three bathrooms, I think, a, a training area. Um, and speaking of bathrooms, obviously there are some implications there about eating, and therefore what come, what you have to do about that when you. Jack has food. a really good story about toilet training for astronauts. Yeah. Now is the time to tell it. <laughs> okay, so so let me set this up a little bit. So when I worked on the space shuttle program, we were developing the software for the space shuttle, and I lived in the same neighborhood. Everybody lived in the kind of same neighborhood. And one of my friends was an astronaut who was training for his first flight. It was Mike Mullane. And he did ultimately fly in four different flights. But we were close. Uh, and he... <laughs> He, uh, he and, I guess, Judy Resnick were, was, his, was one of his uh, uh, shipmates on the very first flight. And I don't remember who the, who the commander was. Uh, but whoever it was, they had to do training to use the toilet. Because if you did that wrong, hmm. you were going to have things not necessarily edible floating around in those bays. And so not they were actually <laughs> setting up. They had them set up it on a toilet that and it had a seal on it. You had to get it right. And, and so to make sure you had it right, they had a camera. <laughs> wait, wait, they had a backup camera? Well, now, oh, now you know where that technology came from. So, 
so to train on this, they had them sit and they would look at the screen with had hash marks on it because they had a camera. Docking <laughs> docking procedure. To see if you were sitting just right because you really didn't want to get this wrong. And Hank Hartsfield, he was the commander. And so Mike said they were all doing this at one point, and my and Hank starts breaking out and laughing. He's sitting on this thing, and he's just laughing. <laughs> and he goes, you know what happens when you laugh like that and you're sitting on your toilet? Your asshole goes... Hey, Pete, you want to describe that for our audience? <laughs> Wink, 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 wink. (laughs) Take your hand, make a fist, and squeeze your fist together. (laughs) Now you're pooping in space. (laughs) Now you're laughing and pooping in space. Yep, that was shuttle. (laughs) Um, I'm going to try, and this is me talking. Everyone brace yourself. Are you sitting down? I'm going to try and lift the conversation up, Denise. Help me out here. Um, horticulture, growing food in space. Where are we, and how long before we can uh, make our own potatoes uh, out of our own own poop? Yeah, we won't be able to make potatoes till we get to Mars, I'm afraid. (laughs) Um, There there are dozens and dozens of experiments. Um, They want to they tried with things that grow really quickly. So radishes, you get a radish in about 10 days. Um, some of the lettuces mm-hmm. that, grow really, that grow really quickly. Um, they haven't mastered tomatoes yet because tomatoes are really complicated in terms of their capillary system and how much water they need mm-hmm. and what they need at the blossom end in order not to have a deficit of calcium. So they're working with different planting materials and different configurations and light So when you're up in space, the light source is different. So they use a lot of grow lights and that sort of thing to make to try to mimic um, the the light conditions and times of day that you would have. Um, So they had really good success with little things and easy things like lettuce and radishes and stuff like that. Um, And they're still working it, um, trying to get. I don't think we have a place big enough to grow enough crops like in a crop like Mm setting, like to grow our own. You know, sure. a broccoli field or a potato field or that sort of thing. So I'm going to use a, a three-letter word that is very, you know, sensitive in some circles. But uh, GMO, I would imagine, uh, genetically modified organisms, uh, would be a great, this would be a great study, um, case study, um, for finding ways to modify tomatoes to have a, a better water reuptake and, and things like that. Exactly, and they the a lot of the so a lot of people are um, categorically exposed to uh, opposed to genetically modified organisms and seed from that. Um, but if you think about it, that is just a more sophisticated way of crossbreeding. Yeah. It's a faster, mm-hmm. more sophisticated way yeah. of crossbreeding. Um, we're going to need to do that yeah. to get to, at some point when we go further out into space. We're going to need to have foods that we have were once on this planet, and we would like to take them out, they will have to be modified. Radiation resistant, temperature, soil uptake. In fact, probably one of the most challenging aspects of the trip to Mars is food. It's going to take us three years to get there. We're going to spend some time there, and if we do come back, that's another three years. Can we really find enough thrust to get six years' worth of food up into the air to get these guys on a trip to Mars. So we have to rethink the packaging, we have to rethink the disposal of the packaging, we have to rethink the actual foods that we're gonna send up there, and whether or not we can grow enough crops um, to sustain us um, on that trip and then back again. So that's a really good point. I think about the individuals who will be traveling for the six years, and we've already talked about the kind of foods you have to eat and what you're limited to, and having to eat paste, and you know, and, and all rehydrated food for six years, like you're not, you're not getting a bowl of cereal. You're not you know, all these different things that 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 make life worth living. Because I don't know about any of you, but I, I don't eat the same thing over and over and over and over again, and that would just make me nuts. And a special kind of person to be able to do that. What, what, we're a little, we're a little bit further away from all pastes and tubes, and I mean, a lot of times the food actually looks like what it is. I mean, the brownies look like 
a brownie and okay. that sort of thing. Um, but the pace are very efficient because yeah. sure. they don't take up a lot of space. Right. And we've gone a, a far way from the metallic containers to polymer containers that don't leave any taste and that are highly resistant to any sort of interference and so and they're much, much lighter in weight. So we may end up back at pace in order mm-hmm. to do it. Goop. I, I, uh, I don't know if any of you saw my talk on Apollo that I did earlier, but on the, the Apollo program, the Saturn V uh, had about seven, seven and a half million pounds of thrust, and that's because the total weight of that system is about six million, right? And so um, in order to get that thing up in space, at first they didn't even know if they could ever launch a human because the weight was so, we didn't have anything to thrust up strong enough, and then that's how they got to these stages. It says, okay, first stage is gone, we'll throw it away. Mm-hmm. And that's how they managed to get it up there. And they went to the moon, and they just walked around. And so we, she and I were talking about this on the way up here, and it's like, well, of course we didn't. We couldn't have made a permanent base there, because that meant bringing all this stuff too. And there was just no rocket available of any kind that would propel us to the moon and take all this crap with us yeah. and leave it or not or whatever you're going to do. Because every pound that you add is another pound of thrust that you have to get out of that machine. So, Denise, we have uh, about 10 minutes left. I only had one other item on my agenda. Okay. But I would like to <clears throat> just leave the, the floor open for anything that you may have brought that you we haven't discussed yet that you think is... Uh, I think we got it. Cromulent. Okay. Crumulant. Or crumulant. Crumulant, that's true. We've covered crumulant. Okay, we're, we're, we're done. I, I just, I think I, there are a couple of people that were um, instrumental in this, and they really paid attention to making sure that the food was going to allow the astronauts to thrive as well as they could um, in a strange environment with food that really didn't always look and smell and taste like the food at home. So, um they, they've done a really fine job, and they're still working on it. There's a lot of food research going on with the notion of perhaps either getting back to the moon or getting to Mars. Denise had a conversation with me that kind of related to one I just had. I'd like her to expand on and that was if you're going to, let's say, colonize Mars or even, and the fact that, uh, or the moon, and the fact that those are ecosystems that you have to protect, right? And so let's say you go, let's take the moon. So you go to the moon, and you're going to put a base there. And people have to eat, and drink, and defecate. So do they, do, is the base in orbit? And then you just send the astronauts down to explore? Because you have to get rid of this stuff somewhere. Uh, but if you take them down to the See surface... tranquility. <laughs> if you take them down to the surface, then you have to provide some place to put this waste. And, and you're... What well, it was... It was well, there's a whole notion of what you see in the national parks where you you carry in, but you carry out whatever you've brought with you. Um, on the space shuttle flights, they actually in, installed a trash compactor on the space shuttle that allowed them, and then they started changing the materials that they were using to allow them to be compacted so they can um, get them out. In the station, they actually, when they get a delivery, what they send back is trash. I mean, so there's con- there, there's this constant dealing with trash. If you're in space and you don't mind sending stuff out the spacecraft and fouling the air that not a lot of people are actually walking around in or dealing with, oh, that's okay, I guess. Um, but if you're going to be on a planet, you've got to respect that territory. And how do you know that what you eliminated from your person isn't going to create some sort of havoc yeah. on that new planet? So. May start terraforming and not realizing it right away. Right. Um, oh. It's a, it's in fact, it, it, I, it, this aha moment to me was you know all these discussions about where we're going to go to Mars, we're going to put a base on. Suddenly we're like, you guys are kidding. Space is really, really, really hard, really hard. And if you don't think through this stuff, uh, you're not going. You're not going anytime soon. You don't even know if we have the capacity to carry that stuff out there. Let alone how you're going to get rid yeah. of it. And are you really going to land on that planet? Or are you going to? What are you going to do? This is, and and I, I've said this before. Space is extremely hard. So when I hear politicians or Elon Musk or anybody else say we're going to do it in four years, it's just BS. It'll kill you. Space doesn't care. I think we're going to have to grow it. We're going to have to grow it. Yeah. Some either on the way to somewhere or um, yeah. we're going to figure yeah. that out. Well, there's and some, then, so and there's then make sure you leave it someplace where it won't bother the ecosystem of the planet. So there's there's two things. 
um, that I want to touch on with that. So you, like you were saying, you don't want to leave it in the environment because that's what you're studying. That's why you're there. Right. If you go to Mars, you're not there to just hang out. Hey, we're on Mars. Right. That's great. <laughs> now you're going there to study Mars. It's the whole reason you're there. And if you change it, right, right what are you studying? I mean, what's the point? What is the whole point of going? Right? And what have you destroyed that? I mean, right. we don't know. And what are the unintended consequences? You don't know. Sure. You have no idea. And the, well, and the second thing, second thing was, uh, so talking about radiation, so radiation when you're when you're traveling from Earth to Mars, there's the, they're worried that the astronauts are going to be killed by the radiation because there's just so much of it, um, and they're going to be there for three years each way, and, and it's just way too much radiation to expose a human body to and expect it to survive uh, any any time. Uh, so they were talking. One of the things one of the one of the people was talking about. And I thought this was a kind of a neat idea, was that. They would pack the food in the body of the ship and use that as radiation shielding, because your hamburgers or whatever—they're not going to get cancer. You know, they're, they're not worried about it, right? In fact, we irradiate food today. Yeah, sure. So you put that in the shell of your ship, and that the whole thing is packed with your food. And but as you eat it, the space that you took that food out of is where you put your waste, and that then is your radiation protection. So that was just one concept. That's very so clever. clever. Very yeah. clever. Interesting oh. that you said hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> because. I, 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 I set you up. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> so, Denise, I, I don't think until I showed you this today. I've never seen this. Uh, this is what I wanted to end on. There are a lot of uh, backyard science, backyard scientists and uh, uh, forward-thinking um, YouTubers who are taking, not advantage, but who are um, trying to think creatively. And uh, I happened upon a video where this uh, uh, UK gentleman put a McDonald's hamburger uh, <laughs> naked, taped it. naked, taped it. <laughs> yes, taped it on the platform using a weather balloon, brought it up into the you know upper atmosphere, uh, and then you know released the balloon and it slowly floated back down. Well, and then it did. It, its reentry was a very slow, and it landed, and it is. Uh, so, for the audio listeners, I'm going to say, imagine the the picture of um, Elon Musk's car in space, but everyone, I give you the hamburger, the Big Mac, in space. <laughs> it's a real thing. This is uh, a video. He ate it, right? He like, ate it. Pete, uh, you, you, you were pretty good at this, uh, and... Um, Denise, you can you can add on to this. What, what was your first idea about they they put this thing naked out through the atmosphere? What was your first thing about how it was going to taste? Oh, it goes through all that pollution and stuff. It's got to taste horrible, <laughs> dirty as anything. And the bread's going to be hard as a rock. Right. Oh. And we're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> so so he said that he, it was sucking the moisture out of his mouth. Right. <laughs> was, I mean, this, this thing was uh, space is hard. <laughs> right, this is hard. All right, it mummified. Mar and, uh, basically, space mummified this thing. Sure. And on that note, I'd like to thank my guests for coming. Where, where, where can they find your stuff, and what do you got for sales? You got some books out there, right? Jack's books um, on Amazon. Um, or for the publisher. Uh, the publisher. Um, my book is The Culinary History of Southern Delaware, a real big seller. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Talks about Scrapple. Yes, it does. does. Well, and I write, a, and I write a weekly uh, food column um, called Cape Flavors, which is available online. I'll well, put a plug in for, for her book, The Culinary History of Southern Delaware. It is really a history of Southern Delaware from the time of the Aboriginals on, seen through the foods and how they evolved and what happened over time. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a hit. In fact, it's won history awards. Right. And Jack, your book's won a war, custom awards, right? Yes, it has. Yes, yes sir. It has. <laughs> Safely to Earth, the men and women who brought the astronauts home, it just won a national uh, 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 women's reporters award as best uh, um, memoir. And memoir. Yeah. It's a very good book. It's, it's a, a first person it's, account. We both read it. It's awesome. first person. It's really awesome. I was telling them, by the way, there is a, 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 a audio version of it. I can't stand it. <laughs> because it's sort of the scholarly uh, person who's talking like I do, and you can hear me. And this thing is all in first person. So when I listen to it, it's like I don't even know who that person. That's is. not me. It. It's eerie. <laughs> all right. So we have a close. We're not going to read because again, we've run right against time. So just check out Mythwits.com. Uh, we have a podcast. We have a vid live video show every Monday night uh, on Facebook. It's Facebook Live Mythwits. It's easy, really easy to find. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>